Yes. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to welcome Laura Thompson to Box. Laura actually gave this exact same talk at Velocity this morning, so she's very, very well prepared. Um, and also she has a lot of stamina, apparently. So uh, Laura and I have worked at Mozilla before, and we helped build a team from two, two engineers to 40 or 50, something like that. So some of these practices you'll see in this presentation will help any company, even if it's not Mozilla. And these are a lot of good tips on how to act as a company, act as a team, and how to communicate. So uh, this will help you if you're not technical, and I'm just really happy Laura is able to share some of the things that we learned. So, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me speak here. I speak very fast, and I have a funny accent. So if you can't understand me, go like this. And I'll try and slow down. Okay. Um, so the title of the talk is Minimum Viable Bureaucracy, as you know. And it's kind of a, a way to think about uh, emergent, chaotic process. Those sound like really big words, right? It's actually hopefully kind of cool. So who is the name of that, right? Um, really, this talk is for managers and proto-managers, or leaders and proto-leaders, and it's also something for people who are not managers or leaders, right? So hopefully everybody gets something out of it. But that's really what I was thinking about when I wrote it. Like, people who are building out a team, or people whose team is growing, um, and people who are on a team and they don't like the culture. So these are all kind of culture hacks and work hacks and things. Hopefully there's something that will work for you. So, why did I write this talk? Um, put your hand if you're an engineer or an ops person. Like, think of yourself as technical. Okay. So if you're one of those people, you'll probably find that, uh, you know what I mean if I say uh, your approach will scale until it doesn't scale anymore, right? You can do something and it will go really well and someone will stop working. I'll give you a really simple example. Let us say that you have built a very simple web app and has a single database and that works fine and you get a certain number of users and everything blows up. So you add more databases and that takes you a certain distance and then everything blows up and you add some queues and some NoSQL and some Hadoop and everything blows up, right? Is this thing that is sort of uh, phenomenal that I think of as phase changes in scaling, right? Where everything you know is useless and you have to start over. Okay. So, there's kind of like an interesting sort of step to curve that goes with this. Everything scales linearly, blows up, and you have to reinvent yourself. So, the reason I'm giving this talk is that teams and companies are the same, right? If there are, if you are one person, you may start up in a garage, you don't need a lot of process. You could probably get away without having any version control, but I would recommend it. Once you hire your first other person, you have to start having some common ideas, which means writing things down. And you can get away with not doing a lot more than that for a while. When you get to about 10 people, you actually start having to have some kind of structure, right? Then you kind of cruise along from about like 10 till you get to about 50, and then you stop knowing what people are working on. Like you know that guy, you say hi to him every day, no idea what he does. Okay, then you get to around 150, 200 people, and you stop knowing everybody's names, right? Um, some other culture inflection points, there's one around like 800 or 1,000 people, and that's where companies think, we're not a startup anymore, we need to be enterprise, and people try to like really over-rotate on process, right? So those are some common phase changes. Um, one of the things that invariably happens with these phase changes is that cultures get toxic. People get unhappy. Everybody's kind of stressed. Some people will leave. Some new people will join. That kind of accelerates the culture change. Right. So, how do you make it scale? That's kind of one of the things I want to answer. One of the things that helps model this is this idea of Dunbar's number. You've probably heard this because it's a meme that does the rounds. Uh, there's a there are a lot of footnotes in this talk. It's on speaker deck. If anything I say is interesting, go to the footnote and read the thing that I'm linking to. So, Dunbar's number says there is a cognitive limit on the number of people with whom you can maintain relationships. There's some very bad evolutionary biology behind it, right? That maps kind of like uh, neocortex size to the typical community size and a whole bunch of different mammals. And what it predicts is that humans can maintain relationships somewhere around 150 or 200 people. Uh, the science is terrible, but the mental model, this sort of concept, certainly has some merit to it. There's some truth in it, but we don't really know why. I'm pretty sure it's got much to do with your neocortex. 
Okay, so having given that as a background on this is the problem that we're trying to solve, let me tell you what I'm talking about. The first thing I'm going to do is define this concept of chaos and talk about what I mean by an emergent system and think about the things that we need to build an emergent system, which are the levels of trust and individual contributor autonomy. So, second thing I'm going to talk about is kind of practicalities. In a chaotic, emergent environment, what kind of process do we have? What kind of artifacts do we need? Uh, how do we solve problems in this kind of chaotic environment? Uh, how, do we, how do we have goals? Like, how do we schedule anything? How do we estimate? And how do we know what we're going to ship, right? All the practical things. And then finally, one thing you might have heard from a lot of people that talk about this kind of stuff is they say, we don't need any managers, right? We're just going to be a flat org, we'll be completely structureless, a kind of like a holacracy idea, like medium or something like that. Anyway, I'm going to give you a sales pitch for why I think that you still need managers. Um, welcome to the screen. I love the screen. So, first section is about chaos. So let me give you a definition. Uh, D. Hopp was one of the founders of Visa. You should read everything he wrote because he's amazing. There's his footnote. The definition of chaos is any self-organizing, adaptive, non-linear, complex system, whether physical, biological, or social, let me add computational. If you work on a sufficiently complex architecture, it exhibits this behavior. Um, the behavior which exhibits characteristics of both order and chaos. Right, where did I come up with this idea? So, a number of CEOs ago at Mozilla, our CEO was a guy called John Lilly, um, who is now at Craylock. And he gave a talk a while back at Stanford, and when he said that uh, Mozilla was chaotic, right? We have a really high degree of chaos, everybody's kind of pulling in a different direction, and somehow a high, level, a high level order emerges. And the characteristics of a chaotic system are that it's very robust, it is failure tolerant, and it's a very creative environment. You think of other systems that are like this, right? Like the internet itself is really a chaotic system. Okay, parts of it can break, but there are so many different bits and pieces that the whole thing is not broken. Um, so yeah, it's kind of interesting. One thing I've heard said at Mozilla too is that the, the chaos it has an immune system, right? When when things go wrong, when something is broken, eventually it heals itself, and it's really strange to watch. So thinking about the type of the system, if you work on any open source projects, if you can, if you work on an open source project, okay. Um, most open source projects are kind of run this way, right? Um, you might think about all the technologies that we use every day in Silicon Valley. We use Linux, and we use Apache, and Nginx, and MySQL, and Postgres, and RabbitMQ, and I could list off a million things. They're all open source. And the vast majority of those are produced by a company, some of them are. Um, nobody is project managing them. Right? How do they ship? How do they ship such quality stuff that we use every day? without project managers and a schedule and a Gantt chart. I will tell you, I've never seen a Gantt chart for any open source project. So, how do they be successful? And some companies are starting to run this way too, so it's kind of what I want to talk about. The reason I started, started digging into this was I went to a talk on management, and the speaker said, management is about having, getting all your ducks in a row. And I'm like, I just want self-organizing ducks. When I see a bee of ducks flying to Florida, Nobody is managing those guys. They know where to fly, they know what they're doing, and somehow they get into a perfect formation and get to Florida. So I want self-organizing ducks. Um, organizational structures are kind of interesting. Um, in general, they tend to be architected rather than emergent um, or organic. I did not draw this. It's a great cartoon. I don't know where you can see it from back there. This is kind of models of how some big companies actually really work. Box is not on here. So Amazon, super hierarchical. Google is kind of like hierarchical, but almost completely connected. Facebook's kind of a mess. Mozilla is probably closest to this. Um, Microsoft, there's groups and they compete with each other. They're trying to fix that. Um, but that's a really unhealthy thing. Um, then you got, they all have guns for each other. Down here you've got Apple, which is like all decisions route through one person. Less so than the Jobs era, but it's still kind of true. And then over here you have Oracle, and I don't know if you can read it from back there, but this is engineering and this is legal. <laughs> so, um, so think about your company where you work and what your org, what your humorous org chart might look like and what you might want it to look like. And I, I tend to think of those kind of like loosely connected decoupled networks are probably more useful. Okay, moving on. If we want to build a self-organizing emergent system, the most important thing to make that system work is trust. Right. Um, I've spent all day at a DevOps conference, and DevOps is like a fancy word that means trust um, and some breaks. Um, no, I really do think that. So there's a, 
and also called Sydney Decker. He writes about um, aviation and plane crashes, mostly. But pretty much everything he says can be applied to other engineering cultures. And I recommend this book to you. If you know nothing about planes, even if you're not an engineer, it's called The Field Guide to Understanding Human Error. It talks about why people fail and how we react really poorly, right? And, you know, it was human error. It was that guy's fault. Um, so one of the things that he says in this book is that nobody comes to work to do a bad job. Think about it, right? In the same way that, you know, the villain of every movie is the hero of his own story, right? Um, nobody comes to work and says, I'm going to go and do, like, write the worst code I can do today. Uh, you know, I'm going to see if I can, like, misconfigure some systems and sales come I'm going to go to work and I'm not going to sell anything. I'm just going to sit back and scratch my belly. It's probably like one guy like that. But in general, you should assume that people come to work to do their job, right? Like, they do for a reason. Um, and that's the first step towards trusting them. So, how can you build trust in your culture? Uh, I'm a horse person, so I'm going to use a horse thing, which is that there's this horse training analogy that says you build a rapport, you build trust with your horse by making many small deposits in a trust bank. So every constructive interaction that you have with someone, you are putting trust in the bank for a rainy day. I'll give you another example. If you your only interaction with someone at your company is when things are broken, you will never have a good trusting relationship with them, right? So think about there's like someone in HR that you only ever talk to when your pay got messed up or something wrong with your vacation or some other kind of benefits. Or there's somebody in ops that you work with and the only time you talk to them is when everything is on fire. That's kind of messed up, right? So think of that person, have that person in your head, that person that annoys the hell out of you and go and take them out for coffee. Um, make it possible to build a relationship, figure out what their motivations are, like why they say no to you all the time. There's probably a reason. They're probably not just doing it to be irritating. Um, and it will pay off for you. I cannot stress this enough. So the first thing you can do is set an example by trusting other people. Um, almost equal is important to be trustworthy yourself, right? Do the things you say you're going to do, even if it's for somebody you don't like, right? Um, <clears throat> keep your commitments. Be on time. Be reliable. Be honest. Um, okay. So a lot of it comes down to hiring too. Uh, to the critical question you should ask when you are sitting there on any kind of hiring committee and saying, should we hire this person or not? Can you, do you believe you can trust them? The answer is no, you should not hire them. It's that simple. You won't come to trust them, right? Um, the opposite may happen, but if, if you sit there and think, I think he's a great engineer, but he's completely untrustworthy, then don't hire this person. Like if you have that bad feeling in your gut, you should trust them. Okay. So why do you want trust? Why is it so important? If you trust people, then you don't need to micromanage them, right? This is step two. You can give them autonomy and say, I trust you to do a good job, and therefore I'm going to leave you alone to do a good job. If you let technical people have lots of autonomy, then they are happier, right? It's one of the three key things to happiness for anyone at any job, um, not being micromanaged. Think about it yourself, right? Um, and the nice thing about autonomy is autonomy enables you as a leader to scale. If you're a micromanager, you can really only manage successfully about a couple of you. Like, I couldn't micromanage more than one because it's not my thing. You can't really micromanage successfully more than about five people. Right. You want to scale your company, so you need to build everybody to be autonomous, to be an autonomous leader. Okay, practical things. So what are some of the, the underlying practices that go along with this kind of culture? You have to have really good communication practices. And good communication practices take practice. Um, I think it's really hard to over communicate, right? Like, people, very large number of people are not good about communicating enough. I would say there is almost nobody that actually does it too much. So, you're going to do something in this autonomous emergent environment. Uh, tell people what you're going to do, tell them when you've done it, tell them how it works, they can learn something from it. So, teams that are effective in a remote environment are really good at this, right? Um, the key thing to the bottom of the slide is asynchrony, right? Make as many communications asynchronous as possible. I'm kind of going to go down a little path for a while and talk about remote stuff for a minute. Mozilla has a lot of remote people. Um, another good talk to watch is interesting to you. Um, previous release engineering manager at Mozilla is a guy called John Odin. He's at Fortin Works now, but he has a talk called We Are All Remotees. Um, I manage that team now, and we're pretty much all remote. I have 30 people and three of them are in an office, and they're not all in the same office. So, um, so why, why do I think remote is a good idea? In general, 
one of the reasons to hire more people is it lets you hire the best people wherever they are, right? It's really hard to hire people in the valley, right? And they don't stay because the opportunities are there. People can growing truckloads of cash up to their tiny little house that they're renting because they can't afford to buy one. Um, and you can hire the, like, the best engineer in the world who lives in Ohio and doesn't want to move here because he can't afford a house, right? So if you have these kind of good communication practices and high levels of trust and autonomy, you can have a remote effective organization. So even if you are sitting there saying, someone said to me that this today about Box actually, we will always have one office and everybody will be in a single office. I'm not sure I believe that, but I understand that the, the mission plan. So and news for you. Chances are you probably end up with more than one because it's really hard to get everybody in one building if you get sufficiently large. Um, you know, or your lease runs out and you end up having to move into two smaller offices, whatever it is, chances are you're going to end up with more than one. You might have to open an office in New York, you might open one in Germany. And then, guess what? You have the remote work problems. So you need the over communication. How do you solve them? So, you need shared communication, space and space, synchronous communication. Everything you do should have a URL attached to it, right? There should be no document that cannot be, does not have like a, find a single place where you can go to find it. You should have some kind of chat box, chat app. Um, you can use, we use IRC, people use Campfire, people use um, HipChat, whatever it is, it really matter. Somewhere people talk to each other online. Um, write stuff down, the wiki, whatever it is, you, whatever your tool is that you'd like. Um, you probably have a bug tracker. There are some successful open source projects that don't have bug trackers. I'm constantly surprised by that. I don't know if anyone who uses Postgres. Postgres does not have a bug tracker. They have a mailing list. That's all. One mailing list. And that's where everything is discussed. So how do you find out what needs fixing? Look at the archives. It would drive me crazy, but okay. Um, email, although email is kind of shrinking. I recommend that you record stuff. Um, especially if you have people in different time zones and you have a meeting. Make sure your meeting is in a Google Hangout and record it. And then you can watch it later. Simple, right? They don't have to, but they can if they want to. The other thing you can do is you can take, get somebody, if you have somebody who's a particularly skilled note taker, we have a couple of people like this. Um, there's this one guy at Mozilla who, when he takes notes from a meeting, it turns into a story and there's drama and explosions. So you'll be reading through it and be like, oh, wow, we've started this in Q3. And then an elephant appeared. Um, I mean, he's a very talented uh, writer. So, one of the things with recording decisions, too, is if you have some people that are in one place and some people that are in another place, and I don't care if they're in working offices, let's say that you and I meet in the kitchen and we're having a coffee and we're like, hey, I know how we can solve this problem. We can do this and this and this and whatever. And then we go away and work on it. That's the wrong step. The next step is I go and I send an email to the team and I say, I met John in the kitchen today and we had this idea and this is what we decided, right? So you take kind of that water cooler decision making aspect out of it. Water coolers are great, that's how you build trust, but you make sure the decision making is communicated. So uh, one of the things with communication is it needs to have a short cycle time, right? Like you'll hear me talk about short cycle times a lot because I think they're really important for everything, right? Shipping code, you'll notice I have a bias and wearing the ship at squirrel. It's a mascot of my team. Um, but you also need to reduce cycle times on your communications. So let me give you an example. Let's say we have a weekly team meeting, right? On Monday. And on Tuesday, something really bad happens. Should we wait till Monday to talk about it? It's just really dumb. Um, to me, it's like the equivalent of like an annual performance review, right? Like, but you, you, you probably, probably all have a story about performance reviews that goes like this. You think you're doing great, your boss hasn't said anything to you for a year, you turn a performance review, and you're like, oh, there's this is thing that you do that I don't like, and you could probably be more productive on looking at your face. So that's the worst thing that could possibly happen. Um, what should have happened is on the first day when you didn't do enough, they should have said, hey, you're not doing enough, right? Like, can we fix it tomorrow? Um, and team meetings are like that too, right? Like, you want to shorten the cycle times. If you want somebody to change something on the team, if you need something from somebody on the team, don't wait for a scheduled meeting. So, I hate meetings. I would like to replace the idea of a meeting with a conversation. Um, so you should have less meetings that have lots of people in them and more meetings with two people having a conversation, right? And it can be face-to-face -face over a water cooler, it can be over a video conference, Google Hangout, IRC, phone, you name it, doesn't matter. Um, and these are some of the things you can do in those conversations. You can solve problems together, you can do pair programming or pair ops. You might, in a maintenance window, all hang out in a video conference together, even if you're not talking to each other very much. It's actually really useful. Like People can be all sitting there working on their own different things and you can blast up a video conference and say, Matt has this look on his face, and it's not a good look. He looks like 
this. And then I can say, yeah, what's, what's going wrong? Something is happening with you, and I can, I can see what it is. What's the matter? And then maybe you'll get something out of it. Um, triage is quite good. Um, we switched actually from doing uh, herbal issue triage to doing chloroquist triage. Makes a big difference in productivity. It's interesting. Uh, communication between teams. If I watch talk to somebody that I don't work with every day, I'm just going to like spend some time to chat to them. Uh, one on one with your boss. Show and tell, we do this kind of once a month, which is basically show up to video on a Friday afternoon and show off your side projects and drink beer or something. Um, and post forms, I think post forms are done well in person. So if all those are conversations, then occasionally you're going to have an actual meeting. Let's say that even if you're a company, you have no meetings, you have to meet a partner. So you have a meeting. Okay, so how to make your meetings better. Uh, write the agenda and then time. If there's nothing on it, don't have a meeting. Um, I've been like going through and cancelling meetings all over the place. It makes everybody happier, and I don't think it makes any difference to the quality of work. Um, you should look at the number of participants. Nothing good ever happened with a meeting in a meeting with more than about ten people on it, um, and less would be better. You should limit the length. Very few meetings need to go for more than thirty minutes. If they can be done in fifteen, schedule it for fifteen. There's almost nothing that takes an hour, but if you schedule an hour, you'll use it. Of spike schedule. Um, if you have more than one meeting, you should cluster them together at the very start of the day, just before lunch, just after lunch, at the end of the day. One of those slots, pick one and stick with it. Uh, Paul Graham has an essay called Make a Schedule. If you're ready, you should. Actually, don't relate to that here, but I think everyone knows what it is. Which basically says if you interrupt a technical person in the middle of flow, then you basically like ruin their entire day. And there's a lot of evidence to back that up, right? So try to schedule things to reduce disruptions. Record the meetings. Also that way if somebody is in like a nice state of flow, they can not come and they can look at the record or the transcript later. Okay. So what else can we do in a minimal way? This is minimal meetings. Let's talk about minimal documentation. Uh, so I think that on any project, the minimal sort of documentation that you need, right, is like if you write this much documentation, nobody will ever read it. Um, how to install some code, how to do something, right? Like how to ship a change, that's probably the most important thing. How to be effective. Uh, roadmap's kind of optional, but like a general, like this is what we're trying to build here. It's good, it can be two sentences. A change log, which you should get from your version control. Glossary is really important. Um, I don't know the biggest companies, but we have a lot of project proposal that we name them very poorly. Um, so I work on the crash reporting system, it's called Socorro. Uh, in Relic, in Release Engineering, we have a system called Tool Tool, which is a tool for shipping other tools. Um, <laughs> there's a thing that has been renamed now, but it was called Large Wooden Rabbit. You're getting the idea, right? They're more atrocious than enemies. So if you're going to have a whole bunch of silly names, things, then you have a glossary. The, other, but the, the reason you end up here, by the way, is that you know it's one of those like two parts promising computer science, right? Um, naming things, uh, cache and validation, and off by my errors. Um, Although I had a recent version of that joke that was uh, the problem with the, the hardest problem in computer science is that we only have one joke that sucks. Um, <laughs> okay, so that's documentation. We want to talk about problem solving. Okay, so in this kind of chaotic, emergent, low process environment, how do we get stuff done? So another way to think about this is how do I apply an open source model? We talked about that before. So, um, you know, open source projects ship and they ship good stuff and they ship often and how do they do that without, you know, having a lot of process. So the, the TLDR of this is that in any given team or project, give people the autonomy to become expert in the thing that they are excited about. Um, let subject matters emerge. So there's a guy in my team that loves Elasticsearch. All he wants to do all day is love Elasticsearch. So we try to support as much as possible because it's really useful to have somebody who knows a lot about Elasticsearch. Um, second thing to that though is to make sure that e everything has more than one person that knows about it, right? They have to have seconds because that person leaves or goes on vacation and then you have a problem. It's the single person of failure. Um, and then all of the things that nobody wants to do, you should rotate them, or better, you should automate them away or just not do them. So, challenge your assumptions. Okay. Uh, so, worked on a lot of different open source projects and this is that they all have, you know, a different way of making decisions and getting stuff done, but there are some big patterns, right? There are often people who are experts in some in something, right? And Mozilla would call that a module owner. Um, 
some other projects before, it's like a benevolent dictator for life, right? There's often somebody who's kind of like knows more than other people. Then you'll have a set of people who also know stuff. Um, so on a Mozilla thing, it would be a set of peers. On some projects, it would be committers, like I might talk about material committers. Um, in, a, in an Apache project, it would be the project management committee. Um, but this is kind of like a general model that you see. One other thing I want to say, you know, if you're talking about the kind of self-organizing systems, a couple of things in an open source project context, self-organizing doesn't mean democracy, right? Not everybody gets a vote, not everybody votes vote is worth the same amount. The second thing is that self-organizing does not mean anarchy. I've worked on exactly one project, and people that worked with me with Mozilla, that was a lot more remember TikiWiki. Um, it's an open source project with a promiscuous patch acceptance policy. Anyone can commit to master. It's horrific. And when they want to ship a release, they back out all the things that are broken. Um, it's just a little backwards. Anyway, so the key of this is that self-organizing systems emerge and they tend to converge on a pattern and a set of processes, but they're not structureless, right? They may be low structure, but there's something. Okay, so solving problems in this environment. So in an environment when it's you're not sort of like saying you will fix these three tickets this week and you will fix those four tickets this week, um, often you find that there are some parts, some architectural problem. I think you probably have something like this in your architecture. That's a bike shed. Everybody time, time it comes up, everybody wants to argue how it should be done, and you never actually get it done because people sit and argue for hours. Um, so the, one really good way to fix this is to take someone that really cares and say do nothing else for a week two weeks, go away and build something, and let's see if it works. Um, I would say like you need to clear their schedule for them, so that's where you as a leader can help. And the other thing is to not let people go down rabbit holes very long, right? Like a week is okay, a month is not. It's kind of like a break point in there where people just kind of go off into a very strange place. Um, the other kind of thing here is this is um, another, another exposure of person, there's a whole bunch of people here. Uh, a guy called Jeff Baylor, who is now a strike, and he had this motto that was come with code. The best way to win an argument is to come with code. <laughs> so we're going to sit down and argue about the right way to do this. So then I will, I didn't win the argument, nobody won the argument, so I go home for the weekend and I hack something together. And on Monday I came back and say, I built this. And all of the people that disagree with you will probably say, well, I don't really like the way that you did it, but I really can't be bothered doing it over time. If somebody can, that's fine too, right? But generally speaking, Turn up with a solution that is actually implemented usually by the argument. It's kind of useful to know. Um, to add to that, many of the kind of the hardest things like rewrites or hard problem solutions get 80% done by one person. Like they'll go away and have a coding marathon and come back and be like, I made it. Um, and then of course you have the, like the, what I call the other 80%, which is like making it shippable and stuff like that, um, and make it not broken. But this idea of kind of a proof of concept of momentum is really important. It gives, gets people motivated, right? And it gives you kind of a path forward. Related to this, um, there's a thing I think of as a culture smell, which is that in very structured organizations, you often get the situation where, uh, let's say you have a product manager, and I apologize to product managers in the room. I know that you are not all painted with the same brush, but product managers say, you have 40 hours a week, and here are the tickets that you're going to do in this week. Like, these are all the things that I need you to do. And here are the designs for them, and here are the wireframes. Just like, here, code robot, and go and make that. This is like the worst thing in the world for an engineer, right? You have to have some say in what you're going to do. Ask anything you think is most important. Um, and you have to have a say in how, right? And I said that, you know, sometimes there are things that have to be done, but some portion of a person's time needs to be spent on what they think is the most important. I mean, they're in it up to their neck every day. They have some idea of what's most important. You know, in some places, like an open source project, people are going to work 100% on what they think is most important. At a company, you know, maybe it's only one day a week, but it can't be zero. If it's zero, people will just leave. You will have high turnover, and everybody will hate you. So it's really important to know. Okay, so kind of a summary of what we've talked about so far. You are trying to push responsibility to the edges, down the tree. All of the responsibility, all of the ownership should be at the lead codes, right? Managers should not own anything. Individual contributors should own everything. Remember those open source models. Think about the different ones and think about what you might steal and apply to your own workplace. A third thing is remember that you have to give people, it's like freedom one, the freedom zero is freedom to change the code, freedom one is freedom to innovate, right? Okay, so 
the things that are not bike shares. Um, how do I make this work in a, you know, uncoordinated organization where a project manager is not coordinating every move? How do I make big things work? And one of the things that you can do is do architectural design collaboratively, like get, get together and figure out how the thing's going to look and how you get, who's going to work on what, and agree on the interfaces, right? That's it. I don't care how you implement anything, but I care a lot how you, how you design the interface. You can agree on the interface. You can change the pieces out as many times as you want to. You ship something and it sucks. As long as the interface is okay, you can keep changing components. Um, so that kind of decoupling and having good APIs is usually what it means. It's much more important than any single component. And it scales better, right? It scales better to a bigger company. It scales better to a partially remote company. Okay. So in general, your architectural goals for writing code things is to have decoupled replaceable things, um, clear APIs, and good tests for each component. There's kind of a, an ops application to that as well, which is that there's some of the same general principles. A couple of things that are slightly different in an ops situation, which is that, I mean, this is true anyway, but there tends to be a thing where you're like, everything is broken. I'm so sure, it's, it's always, it's always, it's always, well, did you measure anything? Did you check anything? Like, what, what's actually broken? What is the slow part? Your gut is stupid. Um, there's a quote from Tim Gray many years ago where he said, the difference between a good programmer and a bad programmer is the willingness to trust empirical evidence over instinct. Uh, okay, so the other thing with us problems is a version of the problem is really good. Uh, remove distraction. If you have a hard problem, take that person off on call, right? Like let them let them immerse themselves in solving the problem. Um, I would say that a trick having a problem immersion as a Problem solving strategy is they need to walk away, right? Don't work a thousand hours a week, go home, and you'll know the solution when you wake up on Sunday morning. The other thing that I kind of want to say here is um, I don't know how DevOps EU or team is, but to make this kind of trust based organization work, not only do you have to kind of trust that other people know what they're doing, but you have to have some respect for it, right? So, this is what I think of in developers as an operational mindset. I was like, it's code complete, and I'm going to throw this pig over the wall to you. Um, but, you know, you should think about how will we operate this? What are the failure modes? How do I scale this? Um, what are the things that need to be monitored? And have I made instrumentation points to monitor those things, right? So, this is kind of the trust each other and act respectfully. Okay, moving on. So, this is for all. I'm going to talk about goals, scheduling, and shipping. Because some of you out there are like, I am a, a certified pig. And this idea of like everything being very low structure is making me very nervous, very nervous right now. So I'm going to talk about how you make goals and how you do scheduling and how you shift. And then I'm going to talk about anti-estimation, um, which is kind of what I do. So first thing, everybody talks about MVP, lean this, lean that, but you apply it to everything, every single thing you do. You know, at the component level, you need to apply MVP. The thing is that you. Uh, Move the bike shell a little bit because agreeing on what is viable is we disagree on these things. Um, but you know, build the smallest thing that could possibly work or have user value, right? And then iterate on it. Short cycles, small increments, Kaizen, right? So, an example of how that might work is when you're building a prototype, I think this is an MMVP, it's a, <laughs> a minimum minimal viable product. Um, but you know, if you're playing with something. To get that out, you then have to look at the prototype you have and say, what's the diff between this and what we would need to make this a shippable thing, right? So that's like the three MVP. Then you think about how would we deploy this thing, then we're going to ship it, then we're going to ship V2, and so on. Okay. I'm going to go on a tangent about estimation. I really hate estimation. Um, I taught software engineering for six years in science school in Australia, and one of my very first professional projects was making a function point estimator in Visual C++. I have never done anything on Windows again, it scarred me. Um, so, you know, there's kind of two ways to do things. You can try and estimate everything in advance. And then there's like all of the agile things, right? I'm not like an, an adherent of any particular methodology. I like to steal the best bits from everywhere. Um, so like all of the agile type things, right? We have kind of a known velocity and you have burn now, you have sprints, whatever. And we sort of have come to know that agile works better. Right? Like everybody kind of has a feeling that like, well you know that if you have a project plan that's a year long, it's going to fail. Um, there's a very old saying from like the 80s and stuff for development, which is that a three month project takes six months. Six months projects take a year, and a year long project will never ship. 
It was a love trip for them. So, why does Agile work better? There's a secret. Agile methodologies are a way to secretly admit that estimation is always wrong. Right? Um, it's just like, kind of like, well, that doesn't work, let's just go around. Okay, let me tell you a story. We've probably all worked on something that looks a bit like this. I don't know how you can read that. It's a big software project. It has five things, one, two, three, four, five. They're completely unnamed. Doesn't matter. It could be like requirements gathering and whatever. All right. So you've built this project plan and then you feel all like smug and warm because you have a plan. Maybe even a Gantt chart. Um, you probably have like a whole bunch of tickets filed and you feel smug. This is the project management equivalent, my friend, of 100% uh, unit test coverage. It does not mean things are not going to break. It just makes you feel smug for no good reason. And then everything blows up and it's not good. So why is this wrong, right? It's five things in that chart. So you forgot thing 1.5, 4.5, 6, 7, 8, 9, because you didn't know anything at the start, right? Like you, you had no idea what you were doing when you made this plan. Um, it was made naively. Thing number five turns out to be infernally difficult, right? Like maybe you're trying to build an optimal solution to something and be complete, it needs faster than light travel, requires no patches of the network ever, whatever it is, but you basically assume that a miracle would occur and it's not going to happen. The fourth thing is blocked on somebody else's team who's like, why is that even interesting? I have bad things to do. Okay, so what's the problem here? The problem here is that if we're using an emergent or chaotic approach, those are very much bottom up, right? Like it's autonomous people working on the things that they think are most important. And estimation and planning are top down, and there's like an inherent conflict there. So, what can we do? So, I talk about this thing called anti estimation, right? Someone says, I really need you to uh, come back, you know, I need you to build this thing. How long is it? Can you have it done by the end of the year? And you say, No because I know nothing about that thing. But I'll take three weeks, and I'll go and make a prototype of the hardest part, the FTL drive or whatever, <laughs> um, that, you know, cat theorem solve or whatever it is. Um, I'll go and try that three weeks, and then I'll come back to you. Um, and having done that, you can make and say, well, okay, I think we can get something kind of nasty in another month. It might take a month. So the trick is to time box everything, right? So time box your prototype.